My name is Nkechi, and um, the talk I'll be giving today is the science behind our creativity process and presence. This is the flow of the talk. Um, I'll be sharing a little bit about myself and what I do and how I got there. Um, sort of the path to how I create the research behind creativity and neuroscience, the practice, and then my work. And we'll leave some time for questions and answers. So I wanted to start the talk off with a quote from Tishnat Han. Um, our own life has to be our message. The reason why I chose that quote is because um, I really do believe that the work that I do and what I've studied and how I've gotten here has everything to do with who I am and what I care about and what truly matters to me. So there's three kind of like sections of what it is that I do and how I spend my time. And um, there's the scientist, there's the artist, and there's the meditation teacher. So those are kind of the three categories of which um, I do work. So very short, um, what, who is Nkechi and what am I all about? Um, well, I'm a neuroscientist, an artist, meditation guide. Professionally, I split my time teaching mindfulness and doing storytelling um, and creative direction for brands. I'm the founder of Indian Lifestyle Studio, which is a creative and mindful agency. So we specifically work with wellness brands to tell empowered, embodied stories. I'm the co-founder of Sitting Matters, which is a another mindfulness company. We design meditation seats. And I'm a choreographer, which means I make dances. And I'm a YBC um, Artist Fellow 2017-2018. And um, I'm a lover of beauty and truth. I live here in San Francisco. So I have these two photos of myself. Um, you can tell from the photo on the left that I felt a certain way about ballet. And the photo on, well, I guess I don't know. Yeah, the left. And then the right is um, a more expressed and cagey. Um, so the reason why I have these photos here is because I started dancing when I was two. And, and if any of you have ever danced or know how the dance like system works, um, you don't start dancing really till you're three. But I demanded to be in dance class because I knew that it was something that I wanted. Um, I really do believe that there's nothing unkind or unloving about the present moment, which I'll explain more as we continue through the talk. Um, but really, I knew that at a very, very young age. There was something that I deeply desired in terms of expressing myself and being able to self-express. So I think it's important to kind of outline, <clears throat> and I kind of arranged this talk to be more of an autoethnography of maybe looking at my life as if it were like a scientific study. Um, so we've got like four categories. There's childhood, there's college, there's actually my, my research, and then there's now. Um, and I categorize them as anxiety, brain and body, study and research. I've been deeply fascinated with my own relationship to anxiety ever since my very first anxiety attack, which was when I was 16. I was sitting in the back row of honors biology and all of a sudden a wave of fear and panic overwhelmed me and my body in an instant. It was a sensation that I'd never experienced before and one that deeply concerned me. And I didn't know if I was gonna be sick. I didn't know if I was gonna faint. Um, I didn't know what was happening. My heart was beating really fast and I had shortness of breath. And I didn't know why. And so I left class, I went to the nurse's office and kind of just was sitting with kind of the experience, not really understanding what was taking over my body and not really knowing, um, and didn't really get any answers then. But high school was the beginning of a very long relationship that I have and have had with um, mental health and anxiety and depression and other related um, anxiety, mental health issues. Um, I think the reason why I ended up choosing to study neuroscience was because I think innately I knew that there was a difference in, in the experience that I had in my body that day in honors biology than there was when I was in dance class. So back to that quote of there's nothing unkind or unloving about the present moment, I definitely experienced a sense of openness and curiosity and wonder and beauty when I was in a studio. 
But when I perhaps was learning about science or having to take a test or having to like prove myself in some sort of way, there was this performance anxiety that would take over me. Um, so I thought if I could understand my brain, then I would be able to understand um, what was happening to me and maybe I could fix it, which is not really how um, it works, apparently. Like it's not how <laughs> you don't just go to college and learn how to fix something necessarily. Um, but I did discover a love for cognitive science and um, a love for behavior and understanding behavior. Um, so that led me to study the brain. And I also studied dance in college as well. So I had this very like, interesting, you know, I would work in the lab and then I would go to the studio. And I was very interested in this relationship between the brain and the body, but I didn't have words and there wasn't really a discipline that kind of merged the two at the time. And um, I ended up going to grad school for neuroscience, um, su still super interested in the brain, but was also simultaneously pursuing my dance um, professionally. And still didn't find like an, a beautiful way to merge the two. I kind of had to, arrived to that on my own much later. Um, the research that I did as a neuroscientist um, varied from traumatic brain injury to um, psych hospitals. And my job that landed me here in San Francisco was a neuroscience job um, working with um, fMRI studies. And that's actually where I learned about mindfulness. So in our research, we were actually treating illness with mindfulness and the different patient categories were chronic pain, addiction, anxiety, and depression. And um, I think this is important for so many reasons, but um, what we were learning is that mindfulness actually did change um, the brains of these patients and their bodies. Um, a lot of them stopped being addicted to opioids or nicotine, chronic pain left the body, anxiety, depression were, were not as big of an issue for them. And it was very profound research that we were doing to treat these different patient populations. But I walked away from that research wondering why we weren't using mindfulness for preventative health. So that brings me to now, which is what I've been doing for the last seven years is actually using mindfulness to, for preventative wellness. I've started a, wellness, a couple wellness brands and use mindfulness as a way for um, my art as well. I am a creative being. You are a creative being. We are all creative beings. Um, this photo is of my father and my sister. You can see my beautiful turnout at, I don't know, age five. Um, so what I wanted to share with, with these quotes and kind of with these images is kind of bringing us all back to how we were as children. Um, I think that children have the most expansive imagination. You can see it in the way that they play and their wonder and awe of the world. And somewhere this gets lost um, in life. <laughs> I believe we're all born creative geniuses. Over time, our creativity diminishes as a result of the education system. Um, it's pretty, it's pretty much a bummer, but the good news is, is that um, we can replenish our creativity with mindfulness and practices of presence. And I'm not just saying that because that's what I do, um, even though I think I figured it out. It's just that it's true. There's research to show. <laughs> <laughs> so creativity over time. So there's actually a study that I wanted to share with you guys, um, conducted actually way back in 1968. Um, Dr. Land with um, Dr. Jarman was looking at 1,600 children um, from the ages three to five, and they were enrolled in a Head Start program. And he used creativity, um, he actually used this creativity test that he um, designed for engineers and scientists to kind of like see which were the best of the bunch, and he used them on children. And then he retested them at age 10 and 15, and then at adulthood. And so according to the scale, this is how it dropped. <laughs> so the children were the most creative geniuses um, at 98%. And then it dropped by the time they were um, 15 or 12, sorry, 10, and then dropped again, age 15, and then dropped all the way down to 2% um, by the time they were adults. So um, 
this was this research was actually conducted over several population groups over a million um, replicated findings. So it's not just you know the six. 1,800 or whatever number I said, but it's actually a lot of people. Um, and what the study later revealed and kind of the theories around why this happened or what's happening for us as we're diminishing our creativity is um, kind of there's these two ways of thinking. So there's um, convergent thinking and there's divergent thinking. So divergent thinking is really what happens when you're a child and the expansive mind, the um, possibility and creativity spacious, open and free thought. It's where you imagine new ideas, original ones that are different than that had come before. Um, and it usually happens subconsciously. And then there's convergent thinking, which is where I think a lot of us kind of spend our time um, it's in judgment, criticism, opinions, and fear-based decisions. And um, it's also a refining process. It's a way for us to make things better and improve them, um, which is happening in our conscious thought. So from this study, George Land and Beth Jarman were able to see that there are two kinds of thinking that take place in the brain. And the first way of thinking is divergent and convergent is the second way. So if there's anything to take away from their study, if we criticize less and be curious more, we're finding ways to increase our creativity. So based on <clears throat> all of the studies in his research group conducted and the brain scans that they looked at, um, I think the overall idea is that how do we increase our creativity by getting to that state of divergent thinking? Um, he also cites that fear and anxiety as being extremely counterproductive. And I think, I mean, I think we all kind of know that at the top of our head, but yet we still exist in that space so much. And I, I say that from experience. I, I know that from my personal experience that like it can be very crippling and debilitating and has been for me and can be for so many people. But one thing that I realized in my research, and I'll be honest, when I was doing the research on mindfulness and literally looking at people's brains and listening to them say that they were no longer addicted to opioids, it didn't motivate me to start med meditating then. It still took me maybe 10 more years to finally land on a practice that was consistent. Um, and I say that to let you know that like, it is definitely a practice and it is a path that like to be taken, it's not just something that you can like force yourself to do, although you can try. But I think um, for me, it really was about finding holistic wellness and really allowing that to integrate into the work that I was doing as well as the art practices that I was doing. I also think it's important to share that like even at a young age, um, my intuitive sense of my body was actually being very honest with me and that my suspicion about my preferred state of creativity was the very, the very thing that was actually going to set me free and allow me to heal. It's amazing to reflect that when I experience even burnout from my career as a neuroscientist, um, or my time spent in yoga and in meditation and, and self-inquiry were the things that actually healed me. And so if it wasn't already clear, mindfulness practices are a beautiful way to um, move towards divergent thinking. So there is hope for the 2% the um, that are looking for more creativity. Um, some of us might feel and have questions around mental blocks. And um, one of the greatest ways to work with our mental blocks is to engage in mindfulness practices like yoga, like meditation, other movement. Um, it could be running. I used to be a competitive runner. That also was like a very embodied, present activity. Um, it also can be the most boring things like doing the dishes, cutting up vegetables. There's so many ways that you can practice mindfulness without sitting on a hill um, wearing white in the middle of nowhere. Um, that's not really feasible for us all to do that, nor is it necessary. Um, there's just ways to practice. Um, and it's beautiful because it's this process um, called neurogenesis, which is just creating new brain cells. So we're retraining our brain 
and we're retraining our bodies at the same time and um, expanding our creativity. So um, one of the things that I'd like to share is um, Julia Cameron's work. Um, she wrote The Artist's Way. Has anyone read the book, The Artist's Way? Five <laughs> people. <laughs> it's a great book. Maybe seven people. Um, so she says creativity occurs in the moment, and in the moment we are timeless. Um, I think she said this like, you know, 30 years ago. I don't know when she wrote the book, actually, but it was way before mindfulness was a really cool word to use. And living in the Bay Area, it's literally a word I hear like 500 times a day and completely incorrectly most of the time. Um, but she's really speaking to being embodied, being present, and um, being in the moment, working with the moment, moment to moment. Um, one of the things that I often say when I teach meditation is allowing things to arise as they're arising. And I say that because what we're doing is we're conditioning our body and our mind to exist here now versus all of the ways in which we exist in the past or um, in the future. And it is a retraining of the nervous system. Um, and that is really the only way to be embodied is to be present. So for those of us who want some tangible ways to um, practice, um, Julie Cameron advocates for something called the artist state. And um, it's a time to be present and attuned to kind of your creative genius and inner child. So I love the idea. So much of her book actually talks about the inner child and um, a relationship that you're building with your inner child which ties nicely back to the research study that I showed before because, um, as we could see from those percentages, the children are the most creative geniuses of us all. So how do we connect back with our inner child? It's still in there somewhere. Um, so her suggestion is to think of it as like a once a week kind of sweet solo expedition to explore something that is interesting to you. And it doesn't have to be creative or artsy, although it can be. Um, and it's really just an encouragement to play and be in the moment. Um, I won't read all of these, but well, I'm sure that those of you in the back can't read them because I can barely read them from here. Um, but spending time outdoors, watching the clouds, going to a museum, illustrating, spending the day naked, having a technology-free day are some of the things on this list. You can just Google Julia Cameron Artist Day too, and there's a bajillion more. Um, so in reflection for me when it comes to the work that I do as an art director, um, so as I mentioned, I split my time between teaching meditation, um, and that takes different shapes, various forms of writing and speaking and workshops and classes, um, but I also art direct. So as a choreographer, it can be fun, funny, difficult, challenging to actually produce dance um, and like earn a comfortable living doing so. So I took all the skills from choreography, production, casting, paying attention to lighting, all the things, um, and can basically tell stories with images, still images. So that's what I do for brands. Um, and for me, it's always a check-in um, for the quality of my work is, and this is my personal creative work, but also the work that I do with brands is, is it embodied? Um, and what I mean by that is, are you in your body? Um, am I in my body? And then is it restorative? So is it bringing energy? Is it nourishing? Is it um, something that's actually good? And then do I feel freedom? Um, so these are kind of the ways in which I check to make sure in my process. And so here's just some examples of brand storytelling of different clients um, that I've worked with. And rather than talking about the actual project, um, I think to be able to create in the way that I do really relies heavily on my mindfulness practice and my other creative practices, So, which is the practice of doing the artist states. One of the things that I do every day, um, a lot of people ask me if I meditate every day, and it's not even every day. Um, but one of the things that I do every day is I write morning pages, which is one of the things that I was most resistant to doing. But um, creating structure, um, which 
honestly sounded like the worst thing ever when it was first presented to me has actually been the thing that has helped me to establish routine and ritual around creative practices. Let's see if these will work. Um, so I thought I'd give you an example of some of the work that I've done and with the time that I see we have, I can maybe show one of them. So yeah, and then here, amazing. Okay, great. Being black, gay and British makes me an anomaly in mainstream society. Dance lets me say who I am without labels and without words. I can't tell you, but I can show you. I tend to be dogmatic. Dance has taught me not only how to be wrong, but how to be excited about it. Because being wrong is a door to the unknown, and the unknown is always exciting. And that's what I want to be as a human. Dance is my first love, but being a choreographer allows me to challenge traditional gender roles that I see in the ballet. And the more we represent different identities on stage, the more people will be able to reach. This is Solomon Golding, Doris Andre, and Miles Thatcher for the ones. Just do that? Okay. Mm. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, and I think that's in this earlier slide. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to share, um, has anyone even heard of the band Polisa? Two people. Okay, well, it's my favorite band. Um, they're amazing. Um, so, <laughs> um, well, okay, I'll talk about these pieces after. Um, but um, with this project, um, I worked with the lead singer of Polisa. Um, her name is Chani, and I worked with her personally, like with styling and embodied presence and mindfulness practices and movement practices for stage, and then also. Um, art directed, choreographed, and then she asked me to be in this video, and um, I had to say yes. Um, so let's see if we can. What is it? Y'all can Google Polisa Wandering Star. There's a live um, studio version at a radio station in Minneapolis that is just one of the coolest videos, live performances. <laughs> Thank you. 
this is to say that um, when I am creative, I feel more connected to myself and that which has created me. And that includes all of the things that inform my work. Um, so that is the end of my talk. Um, if you are interested in connecting with me further, these are the ways to be in touch with me.